Okay, so now I'll briefly introduce you to the idea of Lie groups, and we've seen a simple example, which was SO2. Let's take it up an option and talk about SO3. So I'm always going to assume we're working with the special case. As I said previously, this means we're just restricting to our determinant being positive and plus equal to plus one. So as we saw, SO2 is essentially the, the group that deals with rotations in the two-dimensional plane. Now SO3 is going to be the rotation group in three-dimensional space. So I'm not going to talk too much about the matrix representation as it's basically identical to SO2. We'll see why shortly. I'm just going to really focus on the topology or the geometry of this group. So first of all, as a group, SO3 is going to have three free parameters. And these are traditionally what we call the Euler angles. And we'll see that these parameters essentially correspond to a rotation around one of the coordinate axes. So if we have a three-dimensional space, we have the x, y, and z coordinate axes. I'll just label them. And now the group SO3, essentially, we're going to use to rotate any object inside this three-dimensional space. And we'll see that we can do that by essentially defining a rotation around each of these coordinate axes. So we'll have some amount to rotate around the x-axis. That might be the theta parameter, an amount in the y-axis, and then an amount around the z-axis. And we're going to be able to describe any rotation in three dimensions as some linear combination of a rotation around each of the coordinate axes. Now I just want to quickly note that whilst these rotations are in the coordinate, around the coordinate axes, it actually kind of makes more sense to define them as being not rotation around the axis, but rather a rotation in the plane, which is kind of normal to this axis. So if I take the x-axis, for example, a rotation around the x-axis is actually better said as being a rotation in the yz plane. So if you imagine this is the kind of yz plane, and then we want to perform a rotation around the x-axis, well, it's just a rotation in this yz plane. Okay, so three free parameters. Why do we have three parameters? Well, essentially, there's a general rule now. If you have the group SON, the, the group of now n times n square matrices, these would be 3 by 3 square matrices, you can show that SON is going to have n squared minus n over 2 free parameters. So for the case with SO2, we had 4 squared minus 2 over 2, which is just 1. And then for SO3, we get 9 minus 3, 6 over 2, 3 free parameters. So that's just showing you where these parameters come from. Now let's talk a little bit more about the actual topology of this group. Okay, so as I've already said, SO3 is going to be responsible for rotations in three dimensions. And we've already seen that we can use a rotation around each one of these coordinate axes. Now, how would we perform our general rotation? Well, it's going to be a linear combination of rotations around each of these axes. So how would we then go about representing this kind of topologically or coming up with a visual or geometric representation? So let's say we want to rotate around an arbitrary axis. And we can describe an arbitrary axis simply by drawing some vector from the origin. So this vector which I've drawn is going to define our rotation axis. And now, as I said, this rotation axis is also a kind of, well, it's better to think of it as being a rotation in the plane, which is kind of normal to this vector, or rather the vector is normal to this plane. So defining this vector gives us our rotation axis and we can have the freedom to point this vector in any direction, the freedom to rotate around any arbitrary axis that we like. So now this is represent representing our rotation axis 
and we could now say, okay, well let's scale the length of this vector based on how much we're rotating around that axis, or rather in the plane normal to the vector. So what we do essentially is we say, okay, define some rotation axis, which is just a vector. It's going to be normal to some plane, which is really what we're rotating in. And then essentially all we do is we perform an SO2 rotation in that plane. So we have essentially SO3, all it relies on is the freedom to point this axis in any direction and then we just use SO2 to rotate us in that plane. So I said we should scale our vector based on how much we're going to rotate. So the length of the vector we say is going to scale between, now not 0 and 2 pi, I'll say why in a second, but 0 and pi. So the length of our vector, if it's say equal to pi, that means we're rotating around an angle of pi around this axis. Okay, so why not 2 pi? Well, if you think about this vector defining the axis, we could also define its kind of equal and opposite vector pointing in the other direction. And now we have to or use the convention that we're always going to rotate anti-clockwise, which is kind of stated by saying we use the right hand rule for our rotations. So if the rotation axis points in some direction, so our rotation axis is the vector, we're going to rotate in the right hand sense, so kind of anti-clockwise around the direction of the vector. Hopefully you're familiar with the right hand rule. We could have used the left hand rule as long as we just remain consistent. So why, why is this now only equal to pi? Because essentially this vector rotations along that direction are going to be in an opposite direction to the rotations of the oppositely pointing axis. So if we get all the way up to pi, we've rotated kind of halfway around a circle, and now we can just, rather than saying, okay, well, we're going to go all the way up to 2 pi to get back to where we started, we have to realize that we can do this by rotating in the opposite direction by pi as well. So maybe it's easier if I draw a picture like this. So if that's our origin, corresponding to no rotation, so I'll just note that the identity of the group sits at the origin, which is no rotation. So we start rotating in this direction with this axis, so we're kind of pointing up. We rotate up to pi, so we're, if I just draw the circle, or this is now the plane that we're rotating in, we start at zero, as we follow this vector up to pi, we've gone that much around. So yeah, I'll make that the orange vector, and now if I add in a different coloured vector, we should realise I can kind of effectively cover the other half of this parameter space using a vector pointing in the other direction. Because, so now again we need to remember we're using the right hand rule. This other axis, I should probably change the colour of it on here as well. So it's, it's the same axis as being defined by this vector, it's just pointing in the negative direction. So any positive rotation we make around this axis is going to effectively amount to rotating us the other way in the plane. So now we can see we've effectively covered this full rotation. We know rotations need to go between 0 and 2 pi. We can cover it using these two effectively kind of half half of the parameter space pointing in each direction. So I'll just go over that again because maybe it didn't make complete sense. So essentially we define a rotation axis using a vector from the origin and now we need to remember that the rotation axis is not only in the direction of that vector but it also extends backwards and because we use the right hand rule the kind of direction that the axis is pointing in defines the positive clockwise rotation and now what I'm effectively saying here is that we only need to scale our, lect our vectors up to pi because this half of the vector pointing in that direction covers that much of the parameter space. Remember, this little picture I've drawn here is effectively inside this plane here. 
And now because of the right hand rule, this positive vector points that way, but then when we rotate around this axis, we're effectively traveling the other way. And remember, we would always want to start at the identity, which is going to be this point, corresponding to no rotation. So as we travel along each of these vectors, we effectively fill out this entire parameter space. So maybe I should write that this is the kind of angle, angular theta parameter. It's increasing around as we rotate. And we can effectively cover all of our rotations that we are going to need using these two vectors pointing in the opposite directions. Okay, so now hopefully you'll be able to see what this is effectively going to give us is kind of a solid ball of all possible rotations which are then going to be corresponding to some vector pointing in any direction which defines the axis and then of any length which defines how much around that axis we're going to rotate. So this is going to then topologically kind of fill out this solid ball and it's not going to be the surface of a sphere, it is a fully solid ball, it has an interior and now remember the identity sits at the centre of this sphere and the edge of the sphere it's going to have a radius of pi and now we need to notice something that's extremely important for the topology of this group is that essentially, well we can see it from this picture, where these two arrows are meeting here that has to be the same point essentially in parameter space because these two arrows, they're meeting at theta equals pi, that has to correspond to the same rotation. Because if I just take an object, rotate it by pi in the positive sense, but then also I can rotate it by minus pi in the negative sense, using the axis pointing in the other direction. They have to correspond to the same rotation, and so we now have to realise that this point over here is actually the same point as this one over here. So that's kind of a bit difficult to wrap your head around. How can one, so these are known as the antipodal points, essentially opposite, polar opposite points on a sphere. They are actually the same point of in the group sense because they're talking about the same rotation. So whilst this topologically looks like a ball, it's actually a rather strange and exotic kind of ball in which all of its antipodal points, as they're known, so opposite points on the sphere, polar opposite points, they have to be identified as being the same point. So effectively, this point is glued to that point, this point will be glued to that point, the North Pole is glued to the South Pole. So this is obviously very, very non-trivial topology. Well, actually, it is a fairly simple topological space. It's known as the, the real projective space. So SO3 is homeomorphic to, or topologi topologically equivalent to, the real projective three-dimensional space. Now I'm not going to want to go into too much detail about that, that's an entire video on its own. But you should essentially think of the real projective space as being some kind of space where points effectively meet at infinity. And one way to define that is simply just by taking a sphere and identifying its antipodal points. So that's the topology of SO3. I'll just quickly go over that again. We essentially are saying we have, well, we have three free parameters which we can identify as being a rotation in the x, y, y, z, and then z, x planes, or equivalently as around each of the coordinate axes. And now effectively any SO3 element is going to correspond to some rotation around some axis that points in any direction. And hopefully I was able to convince you that we can kind of represent this using this kind of axis construction where we have one axis that points in the positive sense so we can rotate halfway around. And then in the negative sense we just go back the other way and we're able to fill out the entire rotation parameter space.